Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like so many others, I deeply regret that we are here in what was a totally avoidable situation. I must take you back to January, however, which for many of us was about not repeating the failures of the past and letting Republican voters across the country down once again, when in the past, for many years, when Republicans have had majorities in this chamber, we have passed our major spending bills predominantly with Democrat votes, something the other side of the House has never and would never do with majority control. Back in January, I expressed my concern that the previous two years, during my first term here in this House, we had not used every tool at our disposal to fight against the harmful, radical, Democrat agenda that is destroying the country, bankrupting the country, and under which the American people are suffering. But most in here wouldn't know that I helped persuade my five colleagues who comprised the remaining resistance in the wee morning hours of January 7 to switch our votes to present to let Mr. McCarthy become Speaker. And I went to him on this very floor to tell him that he was finally going to become Speaker on the next vote. In that moment, it was clear to me that I or we could have asked for anything in exchange for switching our votes to present, but I and we asked for nothing. The very next week, I requested and had a meeting with Speaker McCarthy to tell him he had my full support and that I wanted him to be successful because the country needed him to be successful. In the ensuing months, I helped him narrowly pass the Parents' Bill of Rights and the Limit Save Grow Bill, I think both of those by just one or two votes, helping persuade some of my most conservative colleagues to come along despite some of the concerns they had with those bills. And we remained united as a conference through the Limit Save Grow vote as we passed a bill that was cutting spending to pre-COVID levels for non-defense discretionary spending, or just over $100 billion, historic spending cuts, as the Speaker had committed to do in January and it also included a host of other conservative fiscal reforms. Unfortunately, however, that unity and that commitment to significant year one cuts and spending reforms were discarded, were discarded in the Failed Responsibility Act, as I call it, which passed overwhelmingly once again with a majority of Democrat votes, validating the concern many of us had in January. Many of us had begged the Speaker, pleaded with the Speaker repeatedly to utilize the debt ceiling to leverage spending cuts and reforms. But instead, he negotiated an unlimited increase to the debt ceiling through January of 25. As much as we can come together and gleefully spend through January of 25 with no significant wins for the American people in that FRA or Failed Responsibility Act. But the Speaker then said that we would use appropriations. We would use appropriations to bring the fight and finally reduce our spending. He said the levels of the FRA were the ceiling and not the floor. and committed, recommitted multiple times to go back to the $1.471 trillion that was the limit save grow levels, radically, historically, saving $100 billion and lowering the deficit this year under Republican majority from $2.2 trillion to $2.1 trillion. That's what we were asking the Republican House to do, to go to $2.1 trillion. Meanwhile, the Speaker had committed to bring a balanced budget vote to this floor, something that still has not happened, despite the work that's been done in our budget committee to mark it up and have it ready to come to the floor. He also promised that we would bring all 12 appropriation bills well before the September 30 fiscal deadline. We did not. We simply, as Republicans, needed the Speaker to cast the vision, request the support, the support of the entire conference, all of whom voted for the Limit Save Grow levels, except for four who wanted to go even further, to, to lead us in joining him, sticking with him, supporting him 
and sending the most conservative spending bills with the, the most conservative cuts possible to the Senate as the best starting position for negotiations with the Senate. Many of us begged and pleaded with the Speaker to do that over the past five years, five months. When the Speaker failed us to pass our spending bills, bringing only one of 12 to the floor before the August district work period, members began to negotiate amongst themselves without the Speaker to find compromise. I was among those who reluctantly agreed last month to split the difference between failed responsibilities 1.586 and the limit save grow 1.471, I reluctantly agreed to do that, to go to 1.526 in order to pass our bills onto the Senate. We then essentially forced the Speaker, with the pressure of the calendar, the debt ceiling, or excuse me, the, the shutdown threat of the calendar, to bring those four bills to the floor last week, all of which I voted for, despite some of them not cutting the levels we'd agreed to and other concerns I had with the bills. I reluctantly voted for the 30-day conditional CR, or continuing resolution, because it cut an additional $10 billion in the month of October, going back to the pre-COVID 1.471 levels for defense, non-defense discretionary, 30%, and it had border security. I voted for that. However, when that vote failed, the Speaker this past Friday in the Republican conference meeting made it abundantly clear that he was willing to do anything to avoid the temporary discomfort and the pressure of a pause in the 15% of the non-essential federal government operations, which would guarantee that we would lose to the Senate Democrats and the White House. If you're not willing to say no, then you're guaranteed to lose. And that was confirmed with the passage of the unconditional 45-day CR this past Saturday, once again with 209 Democrat votes. The Republican bill, 209 to 1 Democrats, 51 to 0 on the Senate side. The Speaker fought through 15 votes in January to become Speaker, but was only willing to fight through one failed CR before surrendering to the Democrats on Saturday. We need a Speaker who will fight for something, anything, besides just staying or becoming Speaker. If there was ever a time to fight, with $33 trillion in national debt, a $2 trillion deficit this year, 40-year high inflation, 20-year high interest rates, a downgraded credit rating, and for the first time in modern history, the polls showing, despite all the help of the media blaming Republicans in the House, the polls showed that the public was blaming Biden and the Democrats for an imminent shutdown. If not fight now, when would we fight? Now is and was the time. With the Democrats driving the fiscal bus off the cliff at 100 miles an hour, we cannot simply be content to be the party that slows it down to 95 just so we can sit in the front seat and wear the captain's hat. Our current debt and our spending trajectory is unsustainable. We need a speaker, ideally somebody who doesn't want to be speaker and hasn't pursued that at all costs for his entire adult life, who will meet the moment and do everything possible to fight for the country. A red line was crossed for me, I regret, on Saturday, and chose regret that I must vote against the motion to table as I did and to vote to vacate the chair. And I yield back.